bear into such a live stream about five seconds. But I thank the Lord we're able to come back again and be able to go through this beautiful book, this book of Nehemiah, because as we go through the book of Nehemiah, we're going to be able to pull up some of the juice out of this scripture. And as we pull out the juice in this book of Nehemiah, I want you to remember one thing. These people have been at war. And they haven't been winning the war. And by them not having been winning the war, when they got a chance to come back to the land, they are preparing themselves to live in such a way that they can once again gather their, nation, their nationhood and that they can get right with the most high because with the way that they had lived, it caused them to be outside of his presence. And by them being outside of his presence, they are doing everything in their power to get back right. And then we're gonna to see tonight, if we make it far enough, that just having the resolve to do right often is not enough. Let's go ahead and share our screen and go straight into the message because the message has a lot to cover and there's a lot of verses in it. So we're going to Nehemiah chapter 11. And I want you to look at this first verse here. And I want you to remember as we look at these verses, these are people that are now in the position, in the position to set up peace, their own rule, and they've determined to do it under the way that the Most High God want it done. But if we make it to chapter 12 and 13, you will see that something happened. What are we willing to do? What are we willing to sacrifice? What are we willing to take out of our lives that's holding us back so that we can please God most high and do what's necessary to please him? Listen to this first verse in Nehemiah chapter 11. It says, and the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem and the rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of 10, to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, nine parts to dwell in other cities. And one of the beautiful things about having electronics, because I know we're going to go through a lot of names. I'm going to have it read. Andrina, will you control the, um, the sound coming through the conference line? I'm going to have a machine to read some of these verses. So let's listen to the 11th chapter. Nehemiah chapter 11. And the rulers of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people also cast lots to bring one of 10 to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine parts to dwell in other cities. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. Now these are the chief of the province that dwelt in Jerusalem. But in the cities of Judah dwelt everyone in his possession in their cities to wit, Israel, the priests and the Levites and the Nethanims and the children of Solomon's servants. And at Jerusalem dwelt certain of the children of Judah and of the children of Benjamin. Of the children of Judah, Athaiah, the son of Uzziah, the son of Zechariah, the son of Amariah, the son of Shephatiah, the son of Mahalaleel, of the children of Perez. And Maaseah, the son of Barak, the son of Kohoza, the son of Hosea, the son of Adaiah, the son of Joyarib, the son of Zechariah, the son of Shiloni. All the sons of Perez that dwelt at Jerusalem were 403 score and eight valiant men. And these are the sons of Benjamin, Salu, the son of Meshulam, the son of Joed, the son of Pedeah, the son of Koliah, the son of Maaseah, the son of Ithiel, the son of Jeseah. And after him, Gabai, Salai, 900 20 and 8. And Joel the son of Zikri was their overseer, and Judah the son of Senua was second over the city. Of the priests, Jadea the son of Joyarib, Jacob, Sariah the son of Hilkiah, the son of Meshulam, the son of Zadok, the son of Meriah, the son of Ahitab, 
was the ruler of the house of God. And their brethren that did the work of the house were 820 and two. And Adaiah, the son of Jerohim, the son of Peleliah, the son of Amzai, the son of Zechariah, the son of Pasher, the son of Malchiah, and his brethren, chief of the fathers, 240 and two. And Amashai, the son of Azariel, the son of Ahasiah, the son of Meshillamah, the son of Immer, and their brethren, mighty men of valor, and 120 and eight, and their overseer was Zabdiel, the son of one of the great men. Now, I had this thing to read down to verse 14 because of the fact I felt like this person could go ahead and read it for us and we can move through and look at what's going on. Whereas if I read it, yes, I'm going to put the emphasis where I want to. But knowing that I'm going to go back over, I want you to remember these people are coming out of war. They've come out of war. And now because they've come out and they got things set up, they got the walls and everything that I tell you every time that has already been set up. Let's look and see how it is these people are now going to institute their government. They've already made pledges. We've covered that. They've already put themselves under a curse. We've talked about that. But now comes the time that we're going to consecrate ourselves to God more so than just a pledge. Now we're going to pay tribute to our real king. We already got another king, Artaxerxes, that's over us. But to our real king, we're going to, we're going to do what's necessary to please him. So as we look at the rulers of the people dwelt in the city, the city of Jerusalem. Now, Judah had within itself cities. The major city is Jerusalem. That is a, a city of peace. And it says the rest of the people cast lots. So I, I don't know how they cast it. I think one time there was on a video, somebody saying this is how they cast lots. But we would consider it to be a game of chance. But when God allowed the people to cast lots, and use it as one way to determine what he wanted to have done, then we see at this juncture, it's not just a game of arbitrary chance. This is something that they would do. We also see that done in the book of Acts, when they got ready to choose one of the brethren to take Judah's place, who gained his own field, the field of Ekeldema, the field of the blood that he purchased, because he was wicked. I wanted to add that. So they wanted to bring one of 10 to dwell in Jerusalem. Not everybody wanted to live in Jerusalem. Not everybody wanted to live in the city of peace. Now, that is like a softball, you know, when I say like a softball, it's like that is so easy to see. That at this time in the concrete, when I say the concrete, in the geographical area in the earth is called Jerusalem. Not everybody wanted to live there. There's many times people don't want to live in the main city. So these people weren't really wanting to live there, a lot of the people, but we need to repopulate the area. We need the area populated so that we can do the functions that need to be done, things have to be taken care of inside of Jerusalem. And this is the area where God was going to bless in Jerusalem. So you got Judah, a region, and inside of the region, you got a city, and not everybody's wanting to be there because there's money often to be made outside of the city. And there's danger many times inside of the city. We saw that in the book of Jeremiah, that they would come up against the city. Well, it's the same thing you look at America. Who do you think terrorists would really want to, if they're gonna cripple America? You think they go way down to a little place that uh, people own three or 400 acres or 50 acres and before you get to the next place? or a city where people houses stacked on top of each other and going wide, you know, and you can destroy trains and you can destroy buses and airports, etc. So it says, they dwelt, they cast lots to bring the people into Jerusalem, the holy city, nine parts to dwell in other cities, a one to nine ratio. And the people blessed all the men that willingly offered themselves to dwell in Jerusalem. They knew that it was something necessary. So we bless those that are willing to go there. We bless those that are willing to stay there. But there are other people that have determined we're not going unless we're chosen. Three, look at what we have. Now the chief of the province dwelt in Jerusalem. These are the chief of the ones that dwelt there. But in the cities of Judah dwelt everyone 
in his possession. You see, those in the other cities, the other cities are still the cities of Judah. So if you don't get it confused, they dwelt everyone in his possession in their cities. You have some that gave up being able to stay there and micromanage their possessions, that they could grow, that they could prosper, and they would go and stay in Jerusalem. It didn't mean they gave up their properties, but they are on site in the cities. You ever heard of someone named Jesus the Christ? You ever heard of someone called Yeshua or Yeshua who left his possession though he was rich? He became poor, left heaven to come down to earth to dwell with us. Well, I need you to understand that had to come a time that he go back to heaven and rule from heaven. And we're supposed to be taken and we're supposed to be occupying. We're supposed to be busy. We're supposed to be gathering. We're supposed to be fishing. We're supposed to be giving people his commands till he come. So you have people here in some sense of the word, not, not totally, but they're in the city of Jerusalem. And they got other people supposed to be taking care of their business. So it says in verse three again, to wit Israel, the priest, the Levites, the Nethanim, the priest are the ones that or the individual that are able to offer sacrifices to the Most High. The Levites were to teach God's word to the people, as well as the Levites, the priests could teach, but the Levites were to go from city to city, and they would be able to teach the people. And the Nethanims, Nethanims, some people say Nathanims, Nathan means gift, Nethanims, gift of God, and some people believe that they're the Gibeonites. They could be, they both, it could actually be the same thing. And it says, and the children of Solomon's servants. At Jerusalem dwelt certain of the children of Judah and the children of Benjamin. Notice Judah and Benjamin are together again, just like Judah and Benjamin were together before the captivity. And then it goes through and it lets you know these sons. Look, I just want you to look at the word son here. Of the children of Judah, at the eye, the son of Uzziah, son of Zechariah, son of Amariah, son of Shephatiah, son of Mahaliel. And then you see of the children of Perez. Let me see. Sometimes when I look and I see son in the scripture, it'll still be, I mean, uh, children in the scripture to be sons. So let me look up under it. There it is. See, Bain, which means son. They made it plural to be include um, men and women, but Bain actually means son. So what we're looking at is the very thing that when people read the Bible, they don't like to see the begats. And I doubt they'd like to see the son of the son of the son of. But saints, when you see this kind of thing, you begin to understand that genealogy, heritage, ancestry, ethnicity comes from the father. So should you ever be around people that say that they are the true descendants of Abraham, that they are truly the people that you're supposed to bless and that you will be blessed and that they are truly what you would call the Hebrew people, the, the people that are the people of Jews, et cetera. And they say they get their genealogy from the mother and not the father. That's not biblical. That's not recorded in scripture because it could have easily said the daughter of so-and-so or the daughter of Ruth or the daughter of Naomi or the daughter of Hagar or the daughter, of, I mean, the son of Sarah or the son of what's her name, um, Huldah. Not saying that they had sons or they didn't have children. I'm just saying it's going by the father. This is the order that the most I said. So in order for these people that have come from captivity to be in the place that although they may not feel a war, they're still under warlike conditions. You're still under governance of someone else. They're setting things in order by the men that are supposed to be dedicated to God, protecting their family, protecting the community, 
and making sure all is right with the most high. And what that one thing that they're having to do is we got to repopulate the city. If we don't repopulate the city, there's going to be a problem because the work that needs to be done to offer tribute to God most high is going to fail. It's going to come short. And so look at five. And Master Aya, the son of Baruch, the son of Hosea, Isaiah, Adi, Jezreel, Zechariah, the son of Shemari, and you come all the way down to what we read, to verse eight, and it lets you see how many there are: nine hundred twenty and eight. For people to say that the Bible is a fabrication, that the, it's just made up. Look at your genealogy. Think back when this was written, when this was put out, where people could see it. Many of the people could go back and look and say, oh, here's my daddy. Here's my daddy's daddy's daddy, because they didn't use the word for grandfather. They would be able to see their ancestors. They would be able to look and see what part they had to play in reestablishing the nature, the nation. Not only would they see that, but they would also be able to look back and see who messed up. These are things that you look at in documents of antiquity to authenticate the veracity of it. And sometimes not just the veracity of something, but the authenticity of the scriptures. Look at look at nine. The story's giving you more names. Joel, and it goes down and lets you know he was the overseer. Now, if you're thinking, does this sound anything like Hansel and Gretel? Does this sound anything like the three pigs? Is there any, because people say fables. Peter said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we talked to you or we told you about the Lord. Well, somebody say, Tim, this is not about the Lord. Well, if you've ever read Luke chapter 24, he lets you know that the things that were written in the scriptures were concerning him. And just like these people are trying to reestablish, just like these people are trying to repopulate, and just like these people here are trying to set up an order, why do you think that the Most High sent his son? And why do you think he gave them power? And why do you think that he told them to go into the world? Because I'm going to set up a people. I am setting up a kingdom. And I am going to give you shalom. I'm going to give you my peace. And wherever you are, that should be a city of peace. Tim, where do you get this? Are you saying that the people are like a city? Yes. Where you get that from? Matthew 5 and 16. What does Jesus say? You are the light of the world. You want King James? Ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. That's okay. There's a city set on a hill, cannot be hid. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I submit to you that is not saying in particular that these people are a city, but I'm going to give you the truth that he is likening them unto a city. And I want you to see what the Bible says about these same people that are Hebrews. In Hebrews chapter 12, I want you to look at verse number 21. Not only 21, let's look at 22. In my middle panel, he's telling the Hebrew people after he's talked about all of the greatness of the people in Hebrews chapter 11. And he stops with those people that had been sawn asunder, those that had been destitute, tormented, and afflicted. And he said the world weren't worthy of those people. But then he says, we without them or they without us, they could not obtain what they needed. And so he starts out chapter 12 saying, seeing that you are encircled or compassed about with such a great cloud of witness, all of these people that have suffered, all of these people that have been beaten, all of them that have been mocked and had cruel trials, some that had had the dead raised, some that had overcome, some that had captured kingdom, some that had quenched the violence of fire, and all of the things that this writer is telling you about the glory of the Most High. He gets to chapter 12 and says, but wait, wait, wait. Let's look to Jesus. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. No matter what they did, 
they didn't author it. They didn't complete it. They are a great cloud of witnesses. But he said, let's look past them to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He despised the shame, and he is set down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And it also says he was made so much better than the angels in chapter 1. But in chapter 12, verse 22, as he talks to these people, he says something magnificently wonderful. And that which he says in chapter 12, verse 22, I really want you to see it. I'm going to share it with you right now. Look at verse 22. You are come to Mount Zion, the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and ecclesia. See that word there, ecclesia or ecclesia, or church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven to the judge of all and to the spirits of just men made perfect. I submit to you that when we talk about the heavenly Jerusalem, I would submit to you that the city of peace is made up of people that live in that metropolis area. I would submit to you that people make up the city. You can have a place and it's empty and you call it a city, but usually the people are what are called the city. We become the church of God. We become the building of God. We become the kingdom of God, not in totality, but we become a part of it. And therefore we can be called the city of God. And in that city, it must be populated. It can be populated by conversion. It can be populated when we have children and we raise them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and they come to an acknowledging faith with him and it's going to represent the people that are on earth and those that are in heaven. This is what's being done. They are trying to populate the city so that the rule of the kingdom of God will go forth and in those other surrounding areas, the people would be able to come to Jerusalem, to the place where they worship. You got walls around the city. You got all that is going on and they can hear from God. They can do what's necessary during the feast days. They are setting up to be able to praise God. Let me interject this. Sometimes we have to do things to prepare our heart to serve him. Sometimes we have to go and build up things in our own life. It may be prayer. What's that nasty word, Tim? It may be fasting, study. Sometimes we have to spend time with other people that can help us. But it's imperative that we realize that we are not only a part of a kingdom. We are building up a city, a city to the most high God. These people were doing it physically, but they should have also been doing it on the spiritual level as well. Okay, got it. Verse number 10, you got priest, Jedediah, and then verse number, look at the bottom part of verse number 11. Then you have a high tube, which was the ruler of the house of God. They had an order. They had an order, and that order had been given by Moses. We already talked about, they read the law of Moses, I believe, in chapter 8. We saw it, I think, again in chapter 10. We will see it in 13. Look at what it says here. Let's go back and let this man read. Actually, I'm going to read because I, I, I don't know how that sounds. I'll have to ask in a discussion. They may not, it may not be like that I played him instead of me reading it. And the brethren that did the work of the house were 820 and 2. And Adiah, the son of Jehoram, and Palaliah, the son of Amziah, and Zechariah, the son of Peshur, and Malchiah, and his brethren, chief of the fathers, 242. Notice we got those that are in the position of authority. They are involved. They are not sitting back waiting. Do you all remember whenever we would read about Goliath used to come up and challenge Israel before the captivity? It bring me out a man to fight with me and he came up 40 days, bring me out a man to fight with me. And if you win, we be your service. And if you, if you all win about the same thing, and David was bringing his brother and some, some food and he heard this and they wanted to know who, who is this Philistine talking this stuff? Who is he? And then his brother and found, when he found out who it was, 
his brother say, why are you not back there with those little sheep? Those few little sheep. And David said, is there not a cause? The reason I brought that up is that David was willing to go and do what was necessary to win. David was necessary to go be like those chief rulers and be involved. Guess what Saul was doing? The Bible says Saul was under a tree. There comes a time sometimes that the so-called leaders or the leaders, they need to be involved in the work. Actually, all of the time they need to be involved in the work. Maybe not every aspect, but in this case, the chief of the fathers, they were there. And they said, Amashiach is under Israel, and that's a high and Meshulamoth like Meshulamoth, the son of Emer, and the mighty men of war and of valor. There are some men that could fight. We make it as if none of us should ever be able to physically defend ourselves. We make it as if we're always supposed to be passive. Was Jesus always gentle? Was he gentle when he made a scourge of small coins? Three. Now, you know, one is one thing, but the Bible says that they're strengthening a threefold cord, okay? He turned over tables and drove people out. He told the disciples at one time, I believe it is in Luke chapter 22, you don't have a sword? Buy one. Okay, I don't know what this is. Give me a second. Because I don't need anything making noise. I'll turn this off since I'm not letting it read anymore. Give me just a second, because that was irritating to hear that. Okay, now I'm going back to I'm going back to my lesson. It says, verse fifteen. Uh, I'm in fourteen. It says, and the men, the mighty men of valor, 128, and the overseers was Zabdiel, one of the great men, also the Levite, Shimeiah, Hashub, Azrakam, and Hashabiah, the son of Buni. It says, Shabbatiah, Jazbez, the chief of the Levites, notice chief of the Levites, he had oversight of the outward business of the house of God. They are not just doing God's work. They are not just going there to live, but they are making sure that the sanctuary is operative. They're making sure that the place of worship where God's presence is, is still up to par like God wanted it. And the reason that they're doing these things is that you're looking at doing the outside and what's on the outside should be reflective of the inside, but they couldn't do that if they were in their own city. They could not maintain the house of God. Case in point, every day the lamp was supposed to be trimmed, the wick on the lamp. Every day it was supposed to be trimming and burned. Every day they were supposed to be making tributes or they make oblations before God. And then there are certain times of the week they're supposed to get rid of the shoe bread. And they are not supposed to let anybody just come up and touch the house of God and do anything that they wanted to do at the place. We read that when we in the book of Numbers. So they would take care. He had the oversight of the outward of the house of God. And then he said, Metaniah. The son of Michael, the son of Zabdi, and Asaph, the principal, over the thanksgiving prayer. When you see that, and you say to thank God in prayer, what we are looking at is this is something that's demanded. We don't just know how to serve the Most High. There comes a time when you thank Him because you learn to appreciate, but He teaches because you could go thank God by doing something that you ought not do. So he teaches what was to be done. And another thing that I wanted to bring up is when we start looking at what happened and how they were able to do things through, uh, we were able to do things through David, the sons of Asaph, that was not given in Torah for him to do that. But he saw that that was a need. And I believe that by the spirit of God and by his own gifts, talents, and ability, he said, this is how you do it, but we're not going to take away from God's Torah. Let me give you things that you can sing. I'm going to show you how to praise him. I'm going to show you how to praise him with thanksgiving for what he has done, for thanksgiving for who he is. Thanksgiving for what he's done for our ancestors. Thanksgiving for the time that we should have been destroyed. Thank him for the hope that we have. 
thank him for when he's going to bring us back in the judgment so that we don't have to be destroyed. And then when we sing these kind of songs, we're singing songs that will help fortify us, teach us his ways and his statutes so that we can be building up the city of God the way that it's supposed to be built up so that we can leave where we are and that we can go and dwell in the city and that we can be busy about building up his house and his work. I hope that these things will resonate in our hearts. And then it says in verse 11, I mean, in 17, it talks about Abda, the son of Shemuel, the son of Galal and Jedithan, and the Levites in the holy city were 204 score and four. That's 84. It's 284 Levites, teachers, people that are equipped, priests, of the, I mean, priests that are under priests, and then the rest of the nation was supposed to be a priest to the world. But we look at the individuals that are there in the set apart city, the holy city, the set apart city. Why do you think when Naaman, the Syrian, had been healed, why do you think he wanted some dirt from that city? You think he just wanted dirt because there was no dirt in Syria? He wanted some dirt in the area that the God of Israel that had healed him, the God of Israel that had healed him. And this is the place that he sanctified. This is the place where God had set apart for these people. And so what he did, I want some of this dirt. I want some of this dirt from this holy land this set apart land, and I'm going to take it back with me. I don't know if whenever he went to pray with, with his master who worshiped Remen, I don't know if he had some of the dirt in his pocket or if he went home and made like, you know, when people plant things in these planters, I don't know if he went and took him a place and took some of that dirt and put it in a place where he could dedicate and pray to God most high. But what I will say is this man had the right idea. And I um, will say is that what was shown is that when we, when we model what the most high want, when we elevate his power, when we elevate his city above all cities, when we elevate his thoughts above all thoughts, when we elevate his ways above all ways, and people begin to know, they begin to learn how to elevate these things. And guess what? Instead of them taking some dirt to where they are, they can take some of the essence of what we have, some of the life of what we have, the ways in which we have, the spirit in which we have, and God begins to possess that nation as well. Not that he doesn't own it, but to possess it in the hearts of the people. And so that seed that's sown on the good ground, it can grow. Sometimes, sometimes I've seen people take and bring in new dirt so that they can plant what they want. I've seen where people would buy chunks of grass with dirt already on it to put on top of a soil that's not going to produce the grass that they want the way they want it to. But it's enough there that if I bring some good dirt and place over the bad dirt, that the good dirt and what's, I mean, the good dirt and that which is already in it sometimes can take place and grow if I continue to water it and allow it to take over and I've seen lawns and buildings and businesses look like it was never like that before. Verse 19, then it says more of the porters, those that watch the doors, act up, Talmon and the brethren, they kept the gates were 172. If you're gonna have a city of God, if you're gonna have a city of God in your community, you have a city of God in your heart. If you're going to have a place where God's city, where he can rest, where his city, where his rulership rules, you know what you're going to have to have? You're going to have to have discernment. What do you mean discernment? Gates. What do I allow in? What do I keep out? What do I push out and don't allow to come back in? They had gates. They had people that watched the gates. And it says the residue of Israel, the priests and the Levites, were in the cities of Judah, everyone in his inheritance. The Most High wanted us to have an inheritance. The main inheritance that he wanted us to have was him. 
but it wasn't that all the only inheritance I want you to have is in heaven. The only inheritance I want you to have is that you have me. When you have me, and everything belongs to me, and you delight yourself in the Lord or Yahweh, said he'll give you the desires of your heart. Didn't he tell the people that he would give them lands and he would give them other mothers and other fathers and he would and if they would if they would look for the treasure that's in heaven or if they would allow their heart to be set on the things that are above and not on things of the earth and their life would be hid in Christ and God and when Christ who is the life shall appear then they would have what God wanted them to have and that they would have to suffer certain things but didn't you also see that he showed you on one side the things that you would desire on the other side he said seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you then he tell you where your treasure is there will your heart be also then understand when your treasure is on the things that are above often he'll give you the things that are below but don't forget first things must be first on this earth moth can corrupt Thieves can break through and steal. But on this one, we see the picture in the concrete, not the abstract. They had people guarding the gate. And these people had an inheritance. Not just going to let somebody come in and take our inheritance. Just like one time, don't remember exactly where it is. I can tell you it's in 1 Samuel chapter about chapter one through five, I think it's four or five. I know that that's where Dagon got destroyed in first Samuel five. In a real sense, the children of Israel lost their inheritance when they took the Ark of the Covenant out to, to battle with the Philistines and the Philistines captured the Ark of the Covenant, which was a representation of God's presence. But God's presence in the midst of a people that were not supposed to have it was dangerous. God's presence in the midst of a people that were not set aside or set apart to have it was dangerous. How much more for us? It says, I'm in verse 20, and the residue of Israel and the priests and the Levites were in the city of Judah, everyone to his inheritance, but the Nathanims dwelled in Ophel and Ziha and Gispa were over the Nethanims, over the people that were gifted for them to have. And the overseer of the Levites in Jerusalem was Uzziah, the son of Bani, the son of Hashbiah, the son of Mathaniah, son of Micah, the two sons of Asaph, singers over the business over the house of God. These are people that had been designed, set apart by David, by their family, the sons of Asaph, not only to be singers, but these people could also write. When you read the Psalms, you'll see a psalm, a psalm of Asaph. And many times they're very weighty. You won't see it be like hallelujah 50 times. You're going to see some stuff in For instance, I remember I used to go to a church, we used to sing hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. And you might sing that 40 or 50 times. These people get worked up. And many times people don't know what the Hallel was, nor Yah. Read some of the Psalms of Asaph. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with singing and saying hallelujah. And then sometimes they got tired of saying hallelujah and say Holy Spirit. But read some of the Psalms and you see what God had allowed David to do so that the city of God not only would be a place of instruction, not only would the city of God would be a light to the world, but the city of God also would be able to bring joy and instruction to people as they were joining in him so they would not get caught up in a reverie. What do you mean caught up in reverie, Tim? I told you just a moment ago that the Ark of the Covenant got taken. It was in a real sense, just like they had lost their inheritance. Well, by the time David get to be king, after Eli had after Eli had died, Eli was in the position of like being the king. I didn't say he was king; God was king, but Eli was in charge. After Eli was died, after Eli died, Samuel grew up, and they said we will have a king. First Samuel chapter eight, they determined they were going to have a king. They finally got a king. The king was Saul. 
Saul messed up and he got rejected by God most high. He was replaced by David. When he was replaced by David, time had gone on and David wanted to go back and get our inheritance. He wanted to go back and get the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth because when I get the covenant or the ark of God, I will have God's presence back with us. Our city is not the city of God without God being in the midst. Did you catch that? Your city is not the city of God without God in the midst. Your home is not the home of God without God in the midst. Your life is not a life that's dedicated to God without God in the midst. Go back wherever you lost him. If you did have him before and recapture what you had, if you got to repent, if you got to repent, if you got to go pay people back what you owe, if you got to give up a lifestyle, if you got to give up your lifestyle and kill that old man, let him wear out till he just be a memory and let the new man which after God is created in righteousness and holiness and let him take over and have God in the midst then your life will be a life of God. What do you mean a life of God? Didn't the Bible say that what, know you not that your body is the temple, the house of God, the temple of the living God, which you have in you and you are not your own? That's applicable if you're walking with him. So David went to go get the Ark of the Covenant and was bringing it back. And the Ark of the Covenant is supposed to be wrapped a certain way. It's supposed to be carried on, on poles that are overlaid in gold. And the, it's supposed to have the ram skin dyed red and all of this covenant and the blue covenant. But they put on the back of a cart. They were going to praise God. They were dancing. They were dancing. I, I believe the ground probably shook a little bit and it was noisy and it was a lot of praise and worship and they were probably hallelujah and knowing what it meant and they were probably just singing. They were just talking about the glory of God and everybody was excited and the ark shook. The, the, the cart shook and the ark, and we don't want the ark to fall over and us are touching and God killed him. When I was little, the word was killed. God killed him. And David got upset with the Lord. You read more and learn more about what happened. David found out the right way to bring the ark, but they were dancing. They were praising. I would submit to you that if your body is the temple of God and God is dwelling in you and you are part of the city of God, you must know the right way to give him thanks. You must know the right way to worship him. And it's not about talking about carrying him on your shoulder. But it's about you having that yoke on your shoulder. And when that yoke is on your shoulder and he is controlling your thoughts, he is controlling what you do. And he is your burden and he makes your burden light at the same time. Then you establish the city on his words and his premises, not your own. Read Tim, verse 23. And it says, for well, the king's commandment concerning them, a certain portion of them should be for the singers do every day. The king. Now, I think it's the king, David, but it could be Artaxerxes because Nehemiah was not king. I don't know why Artaxerxes would care about this. But this is something that David has set up. So if you disagree with me on that, fine. But it's still the king's commandment that a certain portion should be for the singers do every day. And I know that David set up for the singers to be a permanent part of the worship. And it says, Petaiah, the son of Meshabel, the son of the children of Zerah, the Judah at the king's hand and all matters concerning the people. Then it says, verse 25, for the villages in their field and for the children of Judah, they dwelt in Kajarth Arba, in the villages of Dibon, in the village thereof, and Jacobizel, in the villages thereof. And we keep going. We see Jeshua, Moladah, and Bethlehem. Again, when I read these names, sometimes I go through and I'll define it. I'll go through and define every name and see if it tells a story. But we've seen these lists before. And by Ezra being a priest, giving great detail, by him giving great detail like this, we begin to understand we are dealing with somebody either that's a firsthand eyewitness, which I believe, or somebody that has access to a firsthand witness, which is good when you start doing a forensic. Like when you watch the detective show, how did he die? Oh, shine that light, there's the blood over there. 
Oh, there's the thing. A knife did that. We should do, do forensics. When we go to the scripture, we should think forensically. In other words, what had to be in order for what is to be what it is? How do we go through and see what God is saying? This is what it's there for. It's for our learning. 27. And Hazar and Hazar Shuel and Bathsheba in the village thereof. Ziklag, some of these places, if we look at these names, just look at the Ziklag, that's where David had dwelt one time and the men were going to tell it on David. And then we see Beersheba, which is, I believe this is a place where a well was. These are cities that if you've read the scriptures before, these things should be sticking out. Okay, they really are back. They really are back in places where they have memories and now they're making new memories but they can't just go back and have new memories and let the house of God go to waste. We got to repopulate the city of peace so that we'll have, or that will be a city of peace, not of the absence of anything that bothers us, but that we'll be able to make peace. That's what Finney Haas did. Finney Haas made peace. Well, we'll talk about that later if we need to. And it says in Imriam and Zerah and Jeremuth, to know Adullam, a lot of people love to talk about David in the cave of Adullam. It says, and the villages of Lachish in the field of Azekar and the villages thereof, and they dwelt from Beersheba to the valley of Hin Hinnom. I like when I look at the valley of Hinnom because if you look down, you see where it says Gehinnom, Gehinnom, the valley. This is the place that is the picture of hell. I said, this is the place that is the picture of hell, just like the valley of Topheth. Gehenna, where they offered sacrifices. Gehenna, where it bred a certain type of worm that would continually eat on the refuge and just gnawing, go inside the bones of people. And that's the picture that the Messiah used to be a picture of hell, or what we would call the lake of fire, eternal judgment. I just thought you could just look in there and see it was a real place. It was a real place. And by it being a real place, then you look at the concrete and see what it is, and you get an idea of the picture that Messiah is trying to paint of those that become the refuge that they will not know any longer be a part of the city of God or never wanted to be a part of the city of God. You got them to the valley of ben -Hinnom. It says also the children of Benjamin and Geba dwelt in Michmash, Ajah, Bethel, and the villages Anathoth. And that's the place where you read about that whenever you're going in the book of Jeremiah, Anathoth, these are not new towns, these are not new places. And Nob and Ananiah, Hazar, Ramah, where, where was Samuel a lot of time? In Ramah, Gittim, Hazid, Zeboam, Nebelat, Lod, oh no. Do you remember? Oh no. Oh no is where they wanted Nehemiah to come and meet. And Nehemiah said, ain't coming. And the Lord, well, he didn't say ain't in King James, but I'm not coming. He could tell that they had a plan against him. They really wanted to kill him. And it says, the valley of the craftsmen. Please look at that. The valley of the craftsmen. If you ever learn who the real people of Judah is, if you ever learn who the real people of Judah happen to be, because subject verb agreement, people and are go together, who the people of Judah are, you will see that they're not savages in so far as being ignorant. These people have craftsmen. Tim, how do you know that they're craftsmen, not just because it says this? I want you to understand that the Most High gave them ability to craft and build everything that he wanted built when they built the tabernacle. He had people to do jewels. He had people to do metal. He had people to do wood. He had people to sew and to even be able to take gold and put it inside of linen. When they make it, they were able to work in brass and so many other fine things. And plus they had already been building Ramses for the pharaohs. And it says, and that's important for you to know that they have craftsmen. You think you come to God and you're supposed to never learn anything? You think as the people of God, we're not supposed to have any skill sets? You think as the people of God, all we're supposed to do is just go to what we call to church? We need to have occupations. We need to be able to do what we need to do. Some of us that are, are men of God, we need to have ourselves, have us a job. 
Because if you're dependent upon everything that somebody give you and you got your hands stuck out all the time, they can control you. Paul said, I'm not chargeable to any man. As a man of God, if you don't work, you should not even eat, the Bible says. Let's not get to the place while we're building the city of God that we leave these little things out. Because these little things that we think are little are big. So you got a value of craftsmen that they are not dependent upon other people to do what needs to be done They're on the tabernacle, their own houses, their own city. And if they were doing something like that, it's not because they were inept. It says in the Levites and division of Judah and Benjamin, then it moves on to this artificial, when I say artificial, we, you know, when 12 and one comes in that they didn't do a 12 and one. It says, now these are the priests and the Levites that went over Zerubbabel and Shelethiel and Jeshua. We read about them in the days of Ezra. Jeremiah, and it says, Jeremiah and Ezra, not the same Jeremiah that wrote the book. We're talking about years later, okay? And maybe 70 to 100 years later. Amariah, Malot, Hattush, Shechaniah, Rehum, Merimoth, Ido, Gitanthol, Abijah, notice these jaw on the end of these names. When I went through the Emory Slave Voyages documentation and I showed you all of these names, look, it's names just like this Abijah. Then you see Menem, Mayai, look at this, Mayaidia, Bilga, Menem, Bilga, Shimeiya, Jorib, Jedediah, again, those that I A H is Yah, Shalomok, Hilkiah, Again, look at that, Jedediah, these were over, look, these were the chief priests and of the brethren in the days of Yeshua, or Jeshua. This is the same name that we have for Messiah. It said, moreover, the Levites, Jeshua, Benuai, Kedumel, Sherebiah, Judah, Methaniah, all these eyes, they got Yah in the name, so much so that they've kept their heritage. They don't have a name like, um, they didn't have the name Demetrius that we see in the New Testament. They didn't have a name like Murdoch or Belshazzar. They didn't have a name like Shadrach. Notice they kept their own kind of names as they came out of the captivity. This is important to understand that your inheritance, that your culture, when it's formed by God, is necessary to you building up the city of God in the earth. Although you may not think it's true, but rest fully assured the wicked one will move you away from your culture, will move you away from your God, remove you away from what he has taught you to do this right and wrong so that you will build up his kingdom, that you will build up his cities. Do you understand that the Bible in, in many respects is like the tale of two cities? You have Jerusalem and you have Babel. You have Jerusalem and you have Babylon. You have Jerusalem and get to the end of the book of the Revelation. You'll see Revelation, it talks about 21. He saw the new Jerusalem come down from God out of heaven. But then you see in the book of the Revelation, Babylon is fallen. It's fallen. It's fallen. And I remember reading that when I was 10 years old back in my mama's room, and it scared me because I didn't know what, because I didn't know what Babylon, it was Babylon to me. Like Babylon is fallen. Baby, Lord, it's falling. It's the, it's the mother of every kind of foul beast. And I'm seeing all these horses with these locusts with horses and hair like women and scorpions. And I'm thinking they're going to get me. And it's like I couldn't stop reading it. Tale of two cities. More the Levites, Jeshua, in verse 8. Benoi, Kedmiel, Sherebiah, Metaniah, they were over the thanksgiving, he and his brethren. They were over giving praise there's order you know i've been to places where i've seen people call themselves giving thanks and women falling down on the floor showing all their underwear people on the floor jumping and wiggling like snakes people lay their hand on somebody's head and they say they slain in the spirit really why would you want to be slain in the spirit instead of being made alive and quickened in the spirit help me understand and what's all this falling down why why I got to lose control at the hand of somebody that's supposed to be great? 
Why don't I lose control over my wickedness? Why don't I lose control over my arrogance? Why don't I lose control over being ruled by Satan and being ruled by his city dictates the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life instead of being ruled by the city dictates of the most high. I'd rather be slain to this world that I might be alive to God and build up his city, that I could be truly the light of the world. Why is that? Because the light of this world is a reflection of the one who says in John 8 and 12, he is the light of the world. Verse number 10, 9, and back Bukaya, Unai, their brethren were over against the watches. People are paying attention. And you better believe when people are doing watches, they have learned how to judge what's coming and what's going. And Yeshua beget Joachim, and Joachim beget Elisha, and Elisha beget Jehoiada. Notice this, Yeshua or Yahweh of salvation, you got Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim, you get Elisha. Do you see El in there? That's the name God in there. I want you to feel these things. Jehoiada beget Jonathan, which is another gift, or Jonathan, and he begets Jedua. And in the days of Joachim were priests, the chief of the fathers, Siri, Mary, and Jeremiah, and Hananiah, these people, they were all involved. Priests, Levites, Nethanim, chief of the priests, chief of the Levites, Nethanim, singers, porters, everybody had their place. It didn't say that the priest went and took the place of the singers. It didn't say the singers went in and took the job of the priests. It didn't say that those that were over the house of the Lord decided we're going to get a tambourine. When you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I won't give you a, 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 just a little short taste. I mean, a very short taste of 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And I want you to see that the body of Christ in many ways is like a city that's built upon each person doing their part. Look at what the Bible says in verse number four of chapter 12. Now there are diversities of gifts with the same spirit. There are differences of administration, but the same Lord. We can see that David had an administration where David put these people as singers and Nehemiah had something he had to deal with at the time when these people are coming from war and they still, in some senses, they are almost like a res on a reservation of war. They're not necessarily prisoners of war, but we still over you. We're not going to let you have too much. And at the same time, you're trying to build up the city of God. And if you build up the city of God in the hearts of the people, it will manifest in the city of God would have manifested in Jerusalem. And it says, verse number eight, and now you skip that Tim. verse six, it said there are the verses of operations, but the same God which worketh over all in all. But then it says, but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit with all. To for by one is given the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same spirit, another faith by the same spirit. A lot of times people think faith means that you can declare and decree. How much faith do you think it is when you're going to be thrown in the lion's den and you don't recant? How much faith do you think it takes when an individual is getting ready to be thrown in the fiery furnace and you don't recant? They, these are the ones that we see in Hebrews chapter 11. How much faith do you think it is whenever a person come and defy the most high God and you see that there's a confrontation going on and you know that you have been anointed as king, David. David, you know you've been anointed as king and you know you're supposed to execute the judgment of God and you know you're supposed to be doing the protection of God. How much faith does it take when you are young and this big old tall rascal, this big lip uncircumcised Philistine coming at you? Not faith to get a car, not faith to get a girlfriend, faith to do the work of God. Well, Tim, do you mean I can't have faith to get a No, I didn't say that. But when we're talking about faith here, we're talking about faith that the Most High have told us what to do and told us how to do it, and we are obligated to do it. And you got faith that that which that individual has been told by God to do, that he's got the grace to give us the power to do it because we are building a city. We are a light of the world, and the city has everything that it needs to have built. Why? Just like God had them to build a tabernacle, he provided just like he had Noah to build an ark, he provided. 
saints, we are building, we are building the city of God, the kingdom of God in the earth, in our lives. And then it just says, verse number 10, to one, the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, different kind of tongues, interpretations of tongues, but all these worketh in the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally. Look at that word. That means particularly or individually as he will. Some people would think everybody's supposed to have a certain gift. Some people think everybody's supposed to be able to speak in tongues. Some people think everybody's supposed to do something. Some people, let me tell you something. When you start looking at how these things are done in the scripture, and when you start showing me you got these gifts, let me see these gifts be actualized just like I see in the Bible. I don't want to see your innovation and the articulation of your revelation. I want to see what God said. Because when you start giving me something else, then I'm going to feel that you are confronting me to take what you say and let it override what God say. And now you'll become the author and the finisher of my faith. And yet you haven't been raised from the dead. Neither will I allow Tim to do that. When Tim gets to be the author and finisher of, of his own faith, he's damned. He is fully and thoroughly damned. Look at verse 13. Ezra and Shulam, I'm still in chapter 12. Amariah, Johanan, Melchul, Jonathan, Shebaniah, Joseph, Haram, Adna, Merimoth, Helkai, Ido, Zechariah, Ginnathan, Meshulam, Abdijah, Zikri, Menahem, and Mordot. Here are names that people are not going to want to hear. But we've seen some of these names before. Bilgah, Shemuai, Shemuai, and it says Jonathan, Joriab, uh, Mataniah, and then Jedediah, Uzi, Shalai, Kelai, and Emoth, Eber. And it says, Hilkah and Hashbiah, Hashbiah and Jedediah and Nathaniel. It ends up with like a gift. All of these people, what were they? The Levites in the days of Elisha, Joada, Johanan, and Jedua were recorded the chief of the fathers, also the priests, to the reign of Darius the Persian. What's important about that? We just not going to let anybody be a priest. Because when we get a little further down, we're going to find out that they were allowing anybody to be in the priesthood. They were allowing anybody to be in the city and take up root and buy property or have property to the detriment of all. Let's see if we see it right quick. Verse number 23. It says, the son of Levi, the chief of the fathers, were written in the book of the Chronicles, even to the days of Johanan, the son of Elisha. It says, the chief of the Levi, Hashbiah, Sherebiah, Jeshua, the son of Katmiel, to their brethren over against the praise, give thanks according to the commandments of David, the man of God, uh, the ward over against the ward. That means those that were holding or those that were division against division. And the point being made, this is doing what David said. He didn't say this was written in Torah. He didn't say this is what you got out of Exodus. He's saying this is what David and when David said these things, David was on the inspiration, I believe, of God. And this, this thing stuck with them. As a matter of fact, we began to understand that there are certain things that we have issues or things to do because of situations. I don't think it changes things. Let me give you a case in point. We got war. And the children of Israel getting ready to go in and take Canaan. The children of Israel know you're not supposed to bear false witness. But this woman named Rahab bore false witness and sent the people the other way. In the time of war, it was accepted. It was accepted that she deceived those people and protected the life of the spies and she saved her family. We see the same kind of thing happen with Jael. Jael acted like she was going to be nice to Sisera and killed him. It's war. So I believe that there are times that we see things that's going on in the scripture. And what's the purpose? We are building the kingdom. We are not going outside of God's realm, but we are understanding that in certain situations, we already got the mandate from the most high God that we should have discernment, that we should know what is to be. And when you got two impossible situations, Either I, either I lie, listen to me, either I lie and protect everybody in that building from being blown up, or I say they're in there hiding under the chair and say, I didn't lie. 
I didn't lie. And I let all the saints die. That's because I don't understand the scripture. I'm supposed to preserve the life of the saints. I'm supposed to do good to all men, especially to them that are the household of faith. I'm not lying for my own self-aggrandizement. I'm not lying to get something that I don't need. I am lying in the sense of war and using this as a weapon to block or to barricade somebody from going in and attacking our people. Study that and see if I made sense. If I didn't make sense, I know I'm still telling the truth. In verse 25, Methaniah, Back Bukiah, Obadiah, Meshelam, Talmud, Akbar, the porters, they kept the wards and the thresholds of the gate. They had their own place in the body. They had their own thing to do. And I didn't read on down about the hand and the foot because I want to be through. I actually want to be finished in three minutes. He said, these were the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Jeshu, the son of Josedek, in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and Ezra, the priest. These men held high positions. Nehemiah is the governor, he's the backbone that God is allowed to be seen visibly. And Ezra the priest and the scribe that had been given power all over. And here is the juice. At the dedication of the wall, sought the Levites. At the dedication of the wall, at the time it's going to be set apart, at the time it's going to be made most glorious to the Lord. And they call it Hanukkah of the wall. They sought the Levites out of all the places to bring them to Jerusalem. Because all you all didn't want to live there. They keep the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and with singing and with symbols and psalteries and hearts. So when you hear people talking about Hanukkah uh, from the days of Esther, that wasn't the first Hanukkah. Look at it, look under there. Dedication, Hanukkah. Dedication, Hanukkah. They keeping the dedication, the sanctification, the glorification. Of the, of the emblem of their protection in Jerusalem. And it says, and the sons of the singers gathered themselves together out of both the plain country round about Jerusalem from the villages of Netophali and the house of Gilgal and the fields of Geba and Azmaveth. And the singers builded them villages around about Jerusalem and the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people in the gates of the wall. In other words, what's happening is you're getting ready to dedicate, you're getting purified. And now what we're going to do, we're going to get ready to go in and do worship. And so what the Nehemiah said, I brought up the princes of Judah upon the wall. This is the same wall that was saying, it's a fox go up on it, it's going to fall down. It's going to fall down and it can't get up. It's going to fall down. Nehemiah said, I brought up the princes of Judah upon the wall, and I appointed two great companies of them on the wall. They gave thanks, and they went on the right toward the wall, something that means clockwise, toward the dung gate. And after them went Hoshiah, this is another name like the Messiah, and half of the princes of Judah, Azariah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, Jeremiah, and certain of the priests of the sons with their trumpet, Zechariah, the son of Jehonim, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Metaniah, the son of Micaiah, the son of Zechariah, the sons of Asaph, and the brethren of Shemaiah and Azrael. And I wouldn't be reading it that fast, but since I'm not going through and telling you everything, each one of these names, I'm just going through it, okay? Galai, Mei, Nethanium, and Judah. But notice, Hananiah, or Hananiah with the musical instruments of David, the man of God, and Ezra described before them. I understand that music in some assemblies take over everything. Music is not supposed to take over everything. It is supposed to be an addition. It is supposed to be giving thanks. It's not, it's not about how beautiful I can sing or how beautiful I can play. It's not the time for Jerry Lee Lewis or Little Richard to get in there and show off their abilities. It's about pouring out our heart to God with the song, with the dance, with the symbols. They made loud noise. Let's look at it because we're almost through in this chapter. And it says, in the fountain gate, which was over against them, they went up by the stairs of the city of David, going up on the wall above the house of David, even to the water gate eastward, because that's where the entrance of the gate is to the east. And it says, and the other company of them gave thanks, went over against them. And I, after them, if I understand it right, I think they're going this way. I may be wrong, but that's the best I can understand. And after them, half of the people upon the wall from beyond the tower 
of the furnaces, even unto the broad wall. And from the east gate of Ephraim above the old gate, above the fish gate, Tower Hanel, Tower Mia, even to the sheep gate, and they stood still in the prison gate. So notice what he says. So stood two companies of them that gave thanks in the house of God, and I, and half of the rulers with me. You got two companies of people playing music, giving thanks to God, and it looks as if this thing is so magnificently done that they must have, I don't know if they practiced, I don't know how they did it. I don't think it was all spontaneous. Tim, well, what if it was? Then it was. Okay. But how would all these people, just, well, the spirit, if the spirit told them, but I believe that they planned how and what they were going to do in this dedication, because this is a solemn time to give dedication and thanks for what God has done. All these enemies that were against us, all these people that have lied against us, all these people that have sent letters to kings, we could have been destroyed. All of the stuff that we did ourselves, selling our brethren, and we still under these people, and now we got a wall? We got a city? We got our priests? We got our music? We got everything that we need to be able to rule we got everything we need to be the people of city of god we got god and now what we're doing is giving him tribute do we have everything we need if we do why is it not showing it's the only time you can sing is whenever you get around a group of people there's no song in your own heart paul said we should be speaking to ourselves in psalms hymns and spiritual songs singing making melody in our hearts to the lord i told myself when i was young i said that means you need to read the psalms tim so verse 40 so i had two companies of them that gave thanks in the house of god i and half of the rulers with me and the priests eliakim messiah minayim um micaiah eloaniah zechariah hananiah with trumpets can you do you think that's you think that's soft noise you think that's self? You think that you you think that's not a loud, joyful noise? Have you ever heard a shafar? They are not very soft uh, horns. I have one. They really can put out the sounds. It can bring fear inside of a heart. But it says in Messiah, Shemaniah, Eleazar, Uzziah, Johanan, Melchizedek, and Elam, Ezra, singers sang what? Look at it, verse forty-two. And the singers sang loud with Jeremiah, their overseer. Also that day they offered great sacrifice and rejoiced. For God had made them rejoice with great joy. The wives, they're not like Micah was with David. The wives also and the children rejoiced. It became a family affair. The house of God being rededicated, the wall being, somebody say, Tim, it didn't say the house of God being rededicated, the wall being dedicated. Okay, the wall is ded rededicated, and they've got people doing stuff in the house of God. They're making sure they got money to pay the singers. They're making sure that stuff is being taken care of for the Levites. So therefore, I want you to understand that these people are excited about the whole complex being the city of God, the city of spirituality of God, not spirituality of Persia, not spirituality of Babylon or Syria, and this is what's supposed to be with us, that we would have what we need to praise him while we're keeping the order that he wants and having the power of his and finding joy in him. And as Nehemiah had said earlier, the joy of the Lord would be our strength. He said the children rejoice, so that Jerusalem, look, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. And at that time, some appointed over the chambers of treasures for the offerings or the first fruits and the tithes to gather them out of the fields of the cities of the portions of the law for the priests and the Levites. And Judah rejoiced. Look, Judah rejoiced for the priests and for the Levites that waited. Those that wait and do the service, we're going to make sure they have what they need. We don't want this temple destroyed again. We don't want to leave off serving the most out of the way he wants to be served. We don't want to leave off no more. We want to support that which is ours. We want to build that city which is ours. We want to make sure that we support our own and support our own is by supporting what the Most High says. And these people were excited about that. We can build community when we support the head of our community, which is God and those that he put up under them because they're going to lead us right. They're going to lead us in the judgment. They're going to lead us in the justice. If we can come this far, 
on the Persian rule and in, in, in government, how much further will we go when God break us free? Well, you're going to find out as you continue to read the Bible that they're going to go back into their dirt. Yeah, they will. 42, and the singers and the porters kept ward of their God and watered the purification according to the commandment of David and Solomon. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chief singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving of God. Listen to it. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there, they were chief of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. They weren't making up their stuff as they go. Not like we do. These are men that were inspired. Tim, where you get that from? Read the Psalms. And it says, in all Israel, in the days of Zerubbabel, in the days of Nehemiah, gave portion to the singers and the porters. Those that are giving and making melody to the Lord, those that are singing and thanksgiving as a sacrifice to the Lord, those that pray and offer animals as a sacrifice to the Lord and teach. We give that, and it says, Every day his portion, they sanctified holy things to the Levites, and the Levites sanctified them to the children of God. And I'll stop at 13 and 1. It says, and on that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience or in the ears of the people. And therein was found it was written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever. They're going to find, Nehemiah is going to go in and say, I, I had left and I came back to this. And I'm finding an I'm finding Am, a Ammonite living inside the city, inside the house of God. I got to deal with it. But the reason I stopped at 13 and 1 was this. Out of all of that singing, out of all of that praise, out of all of the people coming back to live in the city of God, the one thing that they did not leave out was going back to read in the instruction in the law of Moses. I submit to you that this book has shown many times that this is where they got their inspiration. This is where they got their dedication. This is where they came and they made these curses and these oaths that they put on themselves. This is where they learned how to set up the city. This is how they learn to do the watch. This is where they learn when it's time to fight to keep things holy. I submit to you that even in the dedication, they did not leave out. Let's go back to the law of Moses. Let's just go back, make sure that we're building this city, that we are building this house, that we are building our community on the foundation of the Most High Word. I pray to God that we would do that. I pray to God that when our life has been ruined, and I do mean ruined, when we have been taken away from that which is good and right, when we have been taken away captive by our own mind in the things that has taken us so far away from him, that we would go back and do like we've seen in the book of Nehemiah. Go back to the word of God. See what's got to happen. Go back and let's get our walls. Let's go back and let's get our altar. Let's go back and seek the presence of God. Let's go back and determine what is it that I'm doing that shouldn't be? What is it that is keeping me from being set apart to God? And learn as he starts working with you to thank him. Thank you for giving the mind to me. Thank you for being there for me. Learn that we got to give him tribute. He's king. And as we make our supplication, realize how important we are to him as a people as lights to the world, as the city of God, and that we are part of a dual family, the family on heaven and earth. I believe if we do these things, that the book of Nehemiah and the, it being written and gone through will make a difference in our life because we can look back at concrete and say, if they did it then, how much more should we be able to do it since Messiah has been here, lived and died, breathed, bled, and taught among us, taught. Do you understand that? I heard a man say, he said, if God was going to be a man, how would he live among us? He surely wouldn't take your wife. He surely wouldn't molest your child. He surely wouldn't bear false witness on you. 
He surely wouldn't just hate you because of your color. Surely he would he would not just allow you to be mistreated and say nothing. Surely he would participate in false witness. Surely he would make you know who you are to the most high God. He's done it. Let's live it, you all. Father, thank you for your blessed, eternal, holy, and righteous word. Let us not let those people outdo us. They knew that they had to do things in the city to repopulate. They knew that they had to build up that which was torn down. And at the same time, they knew that the presupposition was everything had to come through you so that they could be able to do things the way that would reflect you. Help us, I pray, to be lights to this world, that we would be not just like a city, but we are the city that sit on the hill because of the fact you uphold us in your righteousness and we reflect your light. Amen, amen, and even so, amen. I open our class for discussion. If there's any discussion that you all would like to have tonight, we're now open for discussion. Hello? Yes, sir. Tim's here. First Go ahead. Of all, I commend you. I commend you from going through what I know to be a tedious chapter. Um, it it was it was good at what I um takeaways that I have from it. I think you you even made the statement that um I think they were all working together, something along that line. So I, I think you know you referenced Romans twelve, not Romans twelve, but Corinthians twelve, and um I can't remember which one of those. I think it's Corinthians where it talks about the least common part. And even though we we didn't we didn't necessarily see anything to that effect, am I clear or are you very hard to hear me? You're very clear. I think we can see the intricacies. We can see the intricacies of what um, in the physical what the body of Christ is really supposed to be, and that we work harmoniously together, together rather, to please the Lord and offer up a life or lives that are set apart and holy to him and to see that um, I think I can't remember which verse it was where it talked about the, I think the noise was heard yes a far off um yeah far off and and it okay so I, I, there are several verses that come to my mind but taking that the the praises and the joy even though we're looking at it I guess in the sense of the music there was an actual reason, but it made me think um, that ye are the light of the world, city set on a hill, a, a city set on a hill. I think it, it, it might say that cannot be hid, but to to show forth the praises of who um, Yahweh is, but in the people and a true understanding and a true recognition and a true dedication to Him. But um, it's interesting again because I, I mean when you read that thirteenth the first verse in the 13th chapter <laughs> i mean you know it's already like okay we we still have something that needs to be uh, i would say i guess corrected but it, it also made me think of um god prepares the table before me in the presence of mine enemies because you know i think we can read and be tired maybe of names or or so forth but to understand that this is an, under the dom the domination of another nation somewhat but god is, is all the while still preparing them so when when you see that he's fulfilling his word or if we come to um to the knowledge that if if, if we I, i'm hearing that god i don't know if, if, if it sound weird to you all no you, we, we don't we don't hear it that's it's it's just you that's okay. suffering <laughs> I'm, I'm hearing it on, on my phone a little bit but i if, if if we turn toward the Father and really and really be dedicated, you know, I mean, he, he, he can accomplish through us what his will is. So we, we do need to say that kingdom come, that will be done. And 
I, 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 I enjoyed the lesson because it, it is intricate. There's a lot going on. It's like, well, what's what's the purpose? What's the purpose? And you know, I think a little bit of Ephesians too. You know, for the foundation of the world, you know, He has chosen us that we should be. And I might be mixing this to a glory to the praise and honor of Him. You know, so it, I, I thought it was a, a good lesson. I do like how you went to Hebrews in twelve to show, okay, we're looking at physical, but how 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 should we look at this? And it's really to be dedicated to Him. Thank so, you. A little bit right there. Well, you can keep going. And, Nobody know, I, else I, said I anything. So I, I have a question, and it comes from verse 9. Of which um, chapter? Of 12, 12. Okay. Wait a minute, let me make sure, because I, I was turning back and forth. Uh, yeah, this is 12. Uh, when you say it watches, um, are those people kind of like people in top, top towers or something? Oh, I'm this is just like a curious type question for me. Well, I'll read it if you want to. It says, all, all, also, Bagbukaya, yeah, Bagbukaya and Uni, uh, their brethren were over against them in the watches. Um, are they in towers, you know, keeping, keeping, sort of scanning what's going on in case there's some issues that take place? Listen to this word. Mishmeret. Mishmeret. You ever heard the word merit before? Uh, I believe so. Okay. Well, in Hebrew, mish merit, the word is what's to be held in trust, guarded, obligation of service, even duty. That's the way it, it comes up here. And let me, where's Brown's driver and Briggs? The guard to watch the charge. These people looking at whatever kind of requirement they are that is supposed to be and they're having to judge if these things are being done properly whatever mm -hmm. whatever it was they were over so if something was being done and you don't know what's supposed to be you don't have any discernment because you can have people that's in well this um, I, i'm trying not to use a let me just use the illustration and I can go back to the Bible. You can have people in law enforcement and they don't have enough sense to know what's right and what's just sometimes. They really don't. Sometimes they say, well, this is what's supposed to be or, or I got the power and I can make the decision. And sometimes you haven't held what's righteous, the righteous law of God in your trust. You just held that you had authority. In these cases, you got people, certain things, the way it's supposed to be done, watching who go in, watching who go out, go out, who's supposed to be singing, who's supposed to be Levites, who's supposed to be inside the temple. And you will see that mm -hmm. somebody in chapter 13 that I didn't read, let me, just let me, because I looked at the time, and let me see, verse number, look at verse number, uh, is it 17? Verse number four, it's in 13 and four, and it says, and before this, Elisha, the priest, having oversight of the chamber of the house of God, here's a person in charge that's got oversight that should be making sure the things, the requirements are met. He was allowed, allowed to Tobiah, the Ammonite, wow. and he had prepared for him a great, not just a chamber, a gadol, a great chamber. Wherefore, aforetime they laid the meat offerings and the frankincense and the vessels and the tithes of the new wine, the corn and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters and the offerings. But this time I wasn't at Jerusalem. So these rascals, instead of watching and making sure the obligation and the requirements are met, they got a dead gum Ammonite in there and folk not getting done what needs to be done because you not making sure the obligation and the requirement according to the law of God and what we have set up to have done so that they can be taken care of can be done. And so now you got certain of the priests and things that are supposed to be, that supposed to be doing God's work. They are back in other cities doing stuff so they can eat. So that's what I didn't get to, but it looks like the writer was setting it up 
but just show you that these people, Gary, your people are something else. They are. Yeah. I can read about them in, of old time and it's, it's, it's almost as if they pass that kind of DNA on too, doesn't it? Bless you, Tim. Just bless me. What else? Tell Tim. I, I, I just thought I just thought it was good. I mean, you could take it. Let's, if you go from family to <laughs> nuclear to extended to to uh, neighborhood to it, it just it just goes on and on. And then when everybody really determines that we have our own government, so you know we will be a government to ourselves. And just you know, Jesus said how divided against and stuff. It will not stand. I mean, that that sounds like. I mean, it's, it's, it's really just the truth. It is. So um, we we just have to, um, we want to self-rule, just self-rule. And um, it's amazing. Um, I, I talk about the intricacies of this. People will be intricate with what they do and what they'll set up. Yes, Lord. You know, uh, often, often in anticipating, um, what's the word I want to say? anticipating opposition but uh in 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 in, in, a, in a in an unrighteous way you know in an unrighteous way they will, they'll cover their base and so to look at this and to see okay this is really meticulous and this is really too much it's like no if you look at um how they would do uh, i'm bringing architecture and just no specific ancient culture but a lot of times they could they could build buildings without just placing placing those stones on top of each other, uh, heavy stones, and they would fit and and they would withstand so much. So there is a, pre a precision that's necessary. So the more we can learn and understand what the will of the Lord is, he he, he will he will uh, he'll honor himself and and us that will honor him, and be obedient. So. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed the message. I thought I thought it was good, and I, I've tried to teach a chapter with many names, and um, <laughs> it, it can be it can be it can be uh, hard. It can uh, make uh, it can uh, make you understand why people skip them, can't it? Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it can, but I like that he said um, that these things are in for our learning. You know. And I was what, what what is what is in there. And I refuse to every time I go through and say this name means this and it means that because a lot of times we using we're doing the same names and but right. if but if it's just one chapter with names and I, I'll probably do it. it it just depends on how many they group together and what they were you got so many if I see their priests if I see their nethanim I see their porters I see that they're singers I say okay what's the message What's the message? One, I want you to know who they are. Number two, I, those people name uh, inscribed. Number th number three, uh, what I want you to know is that these people are real. You can go back and you can check it. This is not, you know, cunningly devised myth or fable. And then what I noticed, and I could have done it, but I chose not to. I noticed a lot of names of places a lot of names of places that I had read throughout the scripture, but I said if I if I go and show all of that, I'm I'm still going to go back and still show what's going on here. So I just use memory to give some of the illustrative things that I've seen in the scripture that that we should think about as we read this passage. So I I appreciate you looking at the effort and find and finding something in it that was worthwhile. I, I appreciate you letting me know that. Is there anyone else? Did I lose everybody? Did my internet drop? Okay, thank you. I guess it just 
some people just marinating. It was good. It was, uh -huh. Emma, you still there? I am. I was saying hello. I I don't know what it, if, I mean, I hung up or something. Is the call still on or is it off? The call is on. It's supposed to still be on. Can y'all hear me? I hear you exceptionally hear you. well. Did you, did you hear me say hello? <laughs> no, sir, I didn't hear you. I would say hello, hello. But if you if you're gonna if you're gonna speak, uh, of course I will defer. Um, you could go ahead. I I was just gonna say the the um the time that um it took for this. Uh, there's a lot of time in in all of this. And uh, which it, it, it that also speaks of a diligence and uh, I'm, I'm gonna say a, a willingness, but uh, I, I just am I hello, yes, yeah, I, I don't, I keep, I keep my phone seem like it just hung up or something, but anyway, I was just thinking of the time that uh, doing this. I think what what verse is that, and they all is it in Acts where it says they were all had. They were all in one accord somewhere around the probably chapter four second. when they saw when they sold their properties, or at least three before we get to four. Let let Tim look. All that believe were together and had all things common. Let me see. I'm looking at Acts three. Now I move to Acts four. Go backwards. Hey, Tim. Okay, four, they laid it at the apostles' feet. They didn't care about what they, I mean, I'm Acts 434. There it is, 432. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither said any of them that ought of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Is that what you're looking for? Or yeah, is it another it, one? It made me, huh? No, that, it, that's, that's pretty much it. It made me think, you know. Oh, it's two of them. I'm sorry, Gary. There's another one in Acts 2 and 24. I mean, Acts 2 and 44. Okay. All that believed were together and had all things common. So it's two places. Okay. Yeah, that, that's, that's it. Just made, just made me think of um, that, you know, um, working together. If we could do that, like these folks, uh, these um, secret societies have people in all forms of government and all areas of profession, and they be doing their little mess. If fucking we could. If we could come together for us. Anyway. You told the truth on that. Yeah, <laughs> they really are in everything. Entertainment. Yeah. Government got the entertainers to get out here and, and preach to us. And, and make songs up about us doing stuff the government won't us to do. Mm -hmm. Talking about that thing up. Uh, Can you hear me? So, yeah, 
Um, okay. You mentioned the art being taken and, and thinking about the art being taken, thinking about the art being brought back, and you talked about other, and you talked about also, um, don't know if you mentioned David, and they were had all the festivities going on, and they had not ordered everything the way they should have ordered it. Mm-hmm. And so they had all the singers and everything in order, and they were ready to celebrate, and that since the order was not there and you see the same thing here that they're trying to restore the right order um, I had a question about um, well this I do know I'll ask a question later this I do know is that it reminded me of um, I think it's Psalm 137 where it talks about them by the rivers of Babylon uh huh sat down and we wept when we remember Zion and that our captives and our torment is required of us a song. I think that's the song of Zion or something like that. I think it's 137. When we remembered Zion, we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there, they did carry us away captive, required of us a song. They requested for us a song. And they did wasted us mirth, saying, Sing, sing, sing us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? So uh, it reminded me of that because you think about it being and being carried away and then saying, you know, they, the mocking. They'll never return, you know, as if this is this is your demise and, and you should be happy about this position and you should sing for us and you make the best of it. But what you see is it's just that hope that that gives me hope when I read this because look at their position and they were taken captive. Yes. And even though they were not exactly slave and slaves right here, when you talk about um they were able to build houses. Isn't that what Jeremiah said? Yes. And they, but they were still captive. They couldn't go when they wanted to go. They had possession, like Nehemiah, is it Nehemiah, Ezra, say they, and they had possession over our body. Um, is it Nehemiah or, or Ezra that says that? I believe it's Nehemiah, but, I'll okay. find, but I will find out, but go ahead. But to see them restored here and to see them restoring God's order and still main and the way that they maintained it still in the land of their captivity, the way that they kept things and the things in mind that they should have kept in mind that they when they knew that they would come, thanks to uh, Ezra, I mean, not Ezra, thanks to Ezekiel, Ezekiel prophesied that they would return. Daniel prophesied that they would return. And so having that heart of returning and being restored to your office, you know, to your own kingdom, to your own God, and to, to, to serve him, that hope they had in the strange land, they showed that they kept their hope until they returned. Yes. The way that Ezra approached, that the way Ezra uh, approached the king and, and, and said, "How can I? How can I be happy when my ancestors' graves are in ruins?" And to have that in mind, I saw that I was looking when you was reading out of I think it was chapter eleven, uh -huh. and I saw Zara, Zara, son of Judah. Mm. His people came. I kept thinking back, like, what's it? Pharaoh and Pharaoh and Tamar. Yeah, and there is. Sarah is also, that's where Achan came from, right? I got the look. Now, your other one's uh, Nehemiah 9 and 37. I'm going to read Nehemiah, that. Then I'm gonna, okay. It says, and it yielded much increase. In other words, we growing stuff for the other people to whom you have set over us because of our sins. Also, they have dominion over our bodies and over our yeah. cattle at their pleasure. And we are in great distress. And God, know, God knows for a fact 
that many of our men and women in this country were at somebody else's pleasure to do whatever they wanted, how they wanted to do. And Lord have mercy, God's still going to judge. And I love him because he does judge and he is always righteous. We just sometimes don't get it. So I was with him. I was like, Zara, I think that's the I think that's the family that Aiken came that from. It's in the seven and one it says, Now the children, now the children of Israel committed trespass in the accursed thing, for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, and took of the accursed thing. So you're absolutely right. But they, they spell it with a E R A H Zara. That's so that's it. Zara, it mentions it there and uh it mentions it in seven and one and seven and eighteen, seven and twenty-four. Good memory. So it just made me think about, you know, even all the adversity, all the bad decisions all the covetousness. I mean, many were destroyed in the days of it, it, for Aiken trespass. Just still thinking about that and, and how he pre preserved that part of that family to continue to go on and even to that day, even to the day of their return, all through the captivity, even yeah, all through what, two administrators, well, two kingdoms and the still return and the hope that gives because we think we're free but we're not tell the truth and and so if you as bad as it is we we, we still want to sing we want to sing we've got to the place where we can sing the songs of Brian or oh, sing the something we record. yes but we we have gotten to the place that we can sing and we can Think about being restored to that office and to the kingdom that he committed to us and to the duties of that kingdom. Even there, when they were in captivity, they didn't have a, a, a temple. They weren't offering sacrifices on, on, by fire. They had their prayer. They had their fasting. They had the songs. They had the gatherings. And maybe, I don't know if they were able to even do feast days or, or what, did they have that much freedom? But to be able to be restored, to keep, keep, keep him alive um, until they were restored into, into the kingdom. Because the kingdom is always, the kingdom is always, it's whether or not you maintain it. Yes. And maintain him and, and maintain your portion, which is him, like you mentioned. Maintain your portion. And so you see, back then they had, um, I want to say in Babylon, a lot of people may have come and, and gathered with them or from other nations, even during the Persian rule, because they said they got to meet multitude, right? They yes. had to meet people. Yeah. Because they got to get rid of that in chapter 13. But, you, but there was something they saw in that foreign land, though. There was something they saw that drew them to them to want to return and serve their God. And we have to be that to all nations. That's our duty. That's, that's kingdom business. But yes, they had to separate. And it's like, in, and we may be in that time now where, you know, some of us have to, some of us don't. Some of us have the power to bring other people in. Some of us don't. Mm. But just being able to have that type of hope, just seeing that, that gives me hope. Yes, Lord. I tell you, since I've been going through the book of Nehemiah, it's just so much of it that if I hadn't taken the time to go through and and then have to take what you see and put in words where other people can see it. It really, it's, Tim, you, you have a greater respect for Nehemiah now than you ever did before. I thought highly of him. 
but now I think way more highly of him. Would to God when people analyze our lives more and get to know more about us or, or to think about the nuances and things that really must have happened in our life that they could see more of God working through us than they do when they casually meet us. Now, sometimes when I really get to know a person, it's worse. Mm -hmm. And you know, even with that Psalm 137, it gets down to where the person says, uh, I hope what happened to us happened to you, old Babylon. You it, will have your day. That's what and I'm old talking Babylon about. Babylon had his day, and they were delivered. But they got a chance to see it. It's beautiful when God bring his hand down on the wicked and let them taste what they've been doing. Because yeah. they've been they've been so haughty. So haughty. Sing us one of those songs. And Edom. Babylon and Edom are, are mentioned in that song. Where Edom they raise it. Mm -hmm. They were happy to see. There it is in verse 7. Remember, O Yahweh, the children of Edom, in the day of Jerusalem. Who said, raise it, raise it, lay it bare, lay it bare, even to the foundation thereof. O daughter of Babylon, who art thou to be destroyed? Or who art to be destroyed? Happy shall he be the reward of thee as thou served us. Good God Almighty. Let them and, feel and, and, joy. And that day is not over. That, that, that day has come, but that day is coming again. Yes. Baby line. I love it. I don't know. I don't know what that was, Andrina. When I was a boy and I saw Babylon instead of Babylon, and it scared me. I don't know if I thought about some kind of little baby. I don't know. It just seems scary. Yeah. Ain't it almost spelled that way? It is, but yeah. yeah. But I was te I was like ten. Yeah, I, I, I was ten. <laughs> and you You've know, been brilliant a long time. Since. But I was <laughs> taught to read. I was taught to, to read phonetically. I ever heard about a bad bill like the B Y L is bill. I just I saw baby learning. <laughs> And it just said, Babylon is fallen. It is fallen. It is fallen. It is. And I'm like, no, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. But, but we see that there's another group or another entity or another power that's the equivalent of Babylon or Babylon. Mm -hmm. and, and everything that has exalted itself against the knowledge of God and determine we will go to the sky. We will be dealing with those beings of the other planet and we're gonna get the knowledge that we need and we're gonna be eternal, we're gonna be immortal and we're gonna rule. We're gonna rule with paper money. Yeah, we are. But the most high God, he knows. He could take something small, something on a nano level and destroy the biggest man. The worms ain't hairy. Did you just stop speaking? Because I don't hear you anymore. I did. I, I made my point, and it was your turn. <laughs> okay, I'll just wonder. When you say they're going to go up to the sky, I thought about that, that musk dude, that musky dude. <laughs> musk rat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That he's, uh, he's, he's building the amusement. Alright, for adults. <laughs> <laughs> Feeling the starship, you know. And he, everybody's so happy about it. They, 
and it's being televised and they is if he has the new space program i'm assuming i guess nasa is in the background it is i don't know bezos went up today say again jeff jeff bezos went up today oh yeah you know what he went up about 62 miles above the earth and uh, went into the, uh, I think the first layer of what they call space and returned to earth safely. <laughs> yes, a big, big flag. Oh, okay. Well, Branson went so far last week and then that guy, Elon Musk, uh, he, I, he'll get a turn. He might. He might be the first one to smoke some marijuana up there. No, uh, they gonna they gonna go up there and find the COVID vaccination. That's what they gonna do. The real one. Well, I appreciate you all joining, Tim, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Sure. And you all pray for Sabbath yeah, that we have a that we have one that really benefits us and take us to where we need to go. And I ask you all to think about the next book that you would like to cover. There's only a few that I haven't the covered. Person, I was thinking you already, I was thinking you already were thinking about one. Thinking and deciding, you know, we're talking about the book of Ezra, I may finish it on this Sabbath, I may do a topical, but I may just go straight in. I may just go straight into third. I mean, uh, another book. Because I think I've taught Esther before in the olden days. Didn't I, Andrina? Yes, Tim, you did. Okay. Yes. Yeah. I was guessing, Gary. I wasn't sure. We've been doing this a whole, whole lot of years. Yes, sir. I think your hair was still, I think you still had almost all black hair. <laughs> I know I yes, did because I've seen pictures. Yeah, I've seen pictures too. Yes. Well, may, may Yahweh <laughs> bless us and keep us, make his glorious face to shine upon us. Be gracious to us and give us his wonderful, his eternal peace. Good night, everybody. Much love to Amen. you. Amen. Good night. Good night. Love you all too. We love you too, Gary. You're a beautiful person. I hope you mean it. Too. You. <laughs>